to see everybody. Well, we're going to talk about five things the Holy Spirit can do to make you a, um, a better Christian. Before we get into that, I have a little uh, story to tell you. So um, there was a, a Bible study group that was discussing um, the foreseen, the unforeseen possibility of their said, sudden death. And, and the leader of discussion, discussion said, well, we're all going to die someday and no, none of us really know when. But if we did we would all probably do a better job of preparing ourselves for that event. And everybody shook their heads and agreed with the comment that, you know, if you knew you would do, there's things you would do different. And then the leader said to the group, what would you do if you knew that you only had four weeks left um, to live? And, and guy raised his hand and said, well, I'd go out to my community and I'd share the gospel with everybody that I know. And, and, and everybody goes, ah, that's a good idea. And then this lady spoke up and she said, well, I would dedicate all my remaining time to serving God, my family, my church with a greater conviction. And everybody goes, ah, that's wonderful. That's a great thing. And then one guy speaks up and, and, he, and he says, I would go to my mother-in-law's house for four weeks. And everybody's going, why, why would you do that? And he goes, why your mother-in-law's house? Because that will make the longest four weeks in my life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today and ask that you would bless us as we talk about your Holy Spirit, as we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, I ask that your anointing would anoint me to say what I need to say, anoint our ears to hear what we need to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are a Pentecostal church, and uh, I hope you are Pentecostal people. Some people don't really understand what that means when we say that. I think a lot of times when we talk about being Pentecostal, people tend to focus on kind of the outward kind of things, the speaking in tongues, the emotional um, services, and all of those kind of things like that. There's a, there's a movie, uh, and it's probably not a movie that you should all watch. I'm not advocating that you watch this movie, but there's a movie, The Blues Brothers, and there's a scene, scene in The Blues Brothers where they go to church, and um, James Brown is the pastor of the church, and, and there's this scene where they're worshiping, and they're jumping all over the place, and, and they're like jumping way up in the sky, and there's a guy that does, and, and John Belushi, one of the stars in the movie, does... Um, flips all the way down the center aisle of, of the church. And, and, and to them, that's what it looks like when you go to a Pentecostal church. Some Sunday, Deacon Bob will probably do flips down the center aisle of the church. That would be, we'll know it's the Spirit, right? Won't we? And so if I ever did that, you would know it's the, it's the Holy, Holy Spirit. So um, I think a lot of times that's what we think of. But what, what we really need to understand is that being Pentecostal means there are benefits that we're getting from the Holy Spirit. He's doing things for us and with us. Listen to this. This is from John chapter 14 and verse 16. And he says this, I will pray. This is Jesus talking. He says, and I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. So today I'm going to talk about the ways to make sure that you're really a Christian Last week I talked briefly about the need for believers to have the Holy Spirit working in their life. D.L. Moody said this, he said, you might as well try to hear without ears or breathe without lungs as try to live a Christian life without the Spirit of God in your heart. So today I want to show you why it is that you need to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now for some, it simply means they speak in tongues. For others, it's that tingly feeling that they get when someone says, says they have the anointing. I mean, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. Uh, I've seen people holler, run, jump, dance, spin, fall out, and, and several other things that are attributed to the Holy Spirit in their lives. And, and believe me, I'm not discounting those emotional um, responses to the moving of God. But Jesus gave us the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, to be more than just an emotional feeling that usually doesn't even make it to the, our car at the end of the church service. And I have to tell you that having the baptism, at least for me, has made a big difference in, in my life. So I'm going to show you five ways 
that the Holy Spirit um, is, a, is a help to you, okay? So number one, the Holy Spirit will help you respond to the world, okay? How many of you, like me, you have a secular job where you have to go out into the world every day, right? You have to go out there. And how many of you sometimes find that the world doesn't share our values and our beliefs, right? And so they talk different. They think things are funny that really aren't really funny. You know, they, they act different. Uh, the activities they want to do are not exactly the same activities that are helpful for us. And so I found that for me, having the baptism of the Holy Spirit helps me to be able to go out and deal with what's going on in, in the world. Here's what Luke says, the Bible says, Now when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So when we're out in the world and we're trying to figure out how do I respond as a Christian, we don't have to rely on our own intellect but the very words we need to speak, the Bible says, will be given to us by the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to talk about two parts of this real quick. The first is, the Holy Spirit makes us more sensitive to what God is saying, okay? Now, I know right off the bat, there are going to be a lot of people who think only crazy people hear God speak, okay? Okay? Matter of fact, if you watch the media, if somebody says they've heard from God, they're usually crazy or they're evil or something like that. But let me, I want to ask you to consider something about God speaking to us. What good is a silent God? What good would that be if he never spoke? What difference could God ever make in our lives if we never heard from him? Now, one of the problems with a lot of believers is they don't think God still speaks, or they think the only way God speaks is through the Bible. But there's a huge problem with that. Have you noticed that the churches and the Christians who believe that God doesn't speak, or those who believe he only speaks through the Bible, they're dry? Or how about this way? Maybe a better word is boring. Have you ever noticed that if they just say the only way you can hear from God is from the Bible, they're boring? And, and something else I've noticed is that eventually the people in the churches who think God only speaks to the Bible through the Bible become so dry that they themselves stop believing what the Bible says. In America right now, we're seeing this in most of the mainline churches who believe that God only speaks through the Bible. And I could name you the, the organizations, you would know them. I'm not going to do that because we're on the video and I don't want to really go out of my way to offend anybody. But there are whole denominations now who only believe that God only speaks through the Bible and nothing else. But guess what? Right now they're going against the Bible with some of the very things they're putting out there. Because they stop believing. If you don't have the Spirit to keep challenging you, and you don't have the Spirit to bring the words of God to life, you're going to dry up. And then eventually you're going to start walking away from the Bible. You're going to add to or take away from the Bible. And that's what we see here. So the reason that happens is because there's nothing to stir up our faith. If God doesn't speak, then there's no way to know that He's alive and working in the world. Church... We need to understand something. We are the only religion who serves a leader, a God, who died for us and is now living. Church, you and I serve a living God. And I might go further and say, not only is he alive, but he actually talks. If God doesn't speak, there's no way to know. So when we find ourselves in a place where we need to respond to the world, especially when our faith is attacked, the best way to respond is with wisdom and the knowledge of God. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to hear how God wants us to respond. Now sometimes that includes the ability to recall scriptures that we have read or maybe we have heard. So secondly... The baptism of the Spirit helps us to be more sensitive, 
not only to hearing God, but hearing others, okay? The Holy Spirit is a good listener. And he also helps us not to be so focused on ourselves. That's the way he works with me. He helps me not be so focused on myself. Through the Holy Spirit, we become better listeners, and we will actually respond in a way that the world will know that we're listening to them. How many of you know that most of the people that we talk to during the week, what they desire above everything else is to be heard, to be listened to, This isn't really part of my message, but let me just throw this idea out to you. If you are a Christian, you have a story of your salvation. You have a story of how you became a Christian. Can I just challenge you to figure out how to put that story into words that last maybe three minutes? Because most people, when you're in a conversation with people, you've only got three minutes and then they're going to interrupt you or they're going to have their own idea or something like that. You see what I'm saying? Because most people aren't going to stay. Matter of fact, three minutes might be stretching it, really, for some people, right? But if we could learn how to put our testimony into three minutes, that would open a door for us to share. And, and, I, and I guarantee you, if you do that, the Holy Spirit will provide you the opportunity to share uh, that story. So... Um, The Holy Spirit is much more sensitive. He knows the things that that person isn't necessarily saying, but still needs a response to. How often have I have I heard someone get saved in response to something that they heard me say that I never intended to say? Sometimes after the fact, I I will have said something that I don't recall saying, but it was exactly the right response to whatever somebody needed to hear. So the Holy Spirit will help us respond to the world. Secondly, the Holy Spirit will help you pray. Now, honestly, I know you're not going to want to raise your hand on this because you're going to want to make everybody think that you're super spiritual, but I will raise my hand on this. How many of you besides me ever struggle with praying? I struggle all the time with praying. Now, when I have to, one day I was driving my car on the highway, me and Gloria were coming home from Cincinnati to Cleveland, and I was driving my car, and we got right around Strongsville, and I hit a big puddle on I-71, and I hydroplaned, and our car literally turned around in the highway. I just want to tell you that I was able to reach the throne of God. <laughs> so sometimes I know exactly how to pray. But other times I struggle. You know, it's like I want to pray and I know I need to pray more and I need to do it more than I'm doing it. And and so I will try to focus in on doing it and then I get distracted and all kinds of other things. Well, the Holy Spirit will help you. Look at Romans chapter 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So this verse says that the Holy Spirit prays when we don't know how or what to pray. I want you to think about this. We're struggling with prayer, and we have the Holy Spirit who is willing and ready to pray with us and for us when we don't know how to pray. But I want to show you something interesting about this verse. It starts by saying that the Spirit helps in our weaknesses. So I was wondering, what is the connection with my weaknesses and prayer? Well, at first I thought this was saying that the Holy Spirit knows what I really need when I might be praying for something else. You know, like, I'm probably praying for a Corvette when I really need something else, okay? And I used to think that's kind of what that verse Verse was at first. That's what I was thinking. Maybe I'm. Maybe you know. I need the Holy Spirit to help me pray for the right things. I do think that's part of it. But the more I studied this, the more I realized that what this is really talking about is the things, the weaknesses, the things that hinder me in my praying. Now it might be that I'm praying for the wrong things, but I don't know about you. But the biggest problem I have isn't what to pray for as much as it is that things that are hindering me from when I'm praying. 
the distractions, the lack of discipline to pray, the knowledge that I even need to pray. Sometimes I don't even realize I need to pray. Sometimes I'll come up, come up against something and instead of praying about it, I just try to handle it on my own. I don't even, doesn't even cross my mind to pray. Then it goes on to say that yes, there are times when we don't know what we should pray, but the Spirit not only knows what I should pray for, but He will even help with the words. It says even if we can't put it into words, the things we need to pray for. It says, with moanings and groanings. In other words, we don't know the words, but the Holy Spirit does. So all we can do is moan and groan, but the Spirit is able to put in the words. I want you to think about this. It's kind of weird. The Holy Spirit is able to put in the words our moaning and our groaning. For instance, I'm barely, barely, barely in my 60s. Barely in my 60s. Just by a few months, well, a couple years and a few months, but just, you ever notice that when you get to a certain age, see if I can do this, I'll probably be off camera for this, but, you know, you go and you sit down, you know, you sit down, that's good, but then what happens when you're my age and you try to get up? Ugh. The Holy Spirit knows, he can put that into words. The words are, it's hard to get up, right? But how many of you have ever been in a place when you needed to pray, but you don't know how to put into words what you need to pray for? The Holy Spirit. Think about when you're sick and you're going through that and you can't even articulate the words, but the Holy Spirit can take your moaning, I'm sick, oh, I'm sick. The Holy Spirit can take that and put it into words for God to hear a prayer. So, I don't know about you, but I'm glad for the help of the Holy Spirit because it takes the pressure off me, um, often the things I feel about praying. Number three, the Holy Spirit will help you understand the Bible. How many of you can say amen to that? The Holy Spirit will help me understand the Bible. 1 Corinthians 2.10, but God has revealed to them revealed them, this is talking about the Scriptures, God has revealed the Scriptures to us through His Holy Spirit, for the Spirit searches all the things, yes, the deep things of God. There's a story of a young woman who had been told about a famous novel. And so all her friends were reading this novel. So she decided, I'm going to try to, I want to read this novel too. So she began to read it and she found it really difficult. And she would put it down and begin to read something else. And, and, and then she would come back to read it again, because her friends kept telling her what a great novel this was and what a great book it was. Even with the, this gigantic recommendation of her friends, that book just didn't do anything for her. And she just tried to read it, but nothing happened. One day she met the author of the book. Turns out he was very handsome and he was charming. And they became interested in one another. They fell in love. And now... She could hardly wait to read the novel. Turned out, when she started reading it, it was the most exciting book she had ever read. Why? Because she had fallen in love with the author. That's what happens with the scripture when we begin to love the author. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would bring the things we learn to our memory. John chapter 14 and 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and listen to this, and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So that touches on something I said earlier, that sometimes I need the Spirit to remind me things that the Bible has said. Every once in a while, I'll have somebody come up to me and go, because I'm a pastor, and they will come up to me and go, where in the Bible does it say this? So I'm just going to let you in on something, okay? Just so that you know this, okay? I don't have the whole Bible memorized. And I don't know, I know a lot of verses, but I might not know where exactly they're at. But have you ever been talking to someone about the things of God, and all of a sudden, a scripture comes to your mind? 
And you're thinking, where did that come from? Well, because you read it somewhere. It's the Holy Spirit that's bringing it to you. So, so the Holy Spirit reminds me of things. Sometimes I'm talking with someone, and the Spirit will remind me something that I had forgotten was in the Bible. Number four. Everybody doing okay? The Holy Spirit will help you overcome sin. Okay, I'm just going to admit to you, this is an area where the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit works overtime with me to help me overcome sin. He has to, okay? So he wants to help you overcome sin. We're going to read this from John chapter 16 and verse 7. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and of sin because they do not believe in me. I want to take that verse apart for just a little bit. One of the problems I see with the condition of salvation in today's world is that we say this little paragraph prayer. Believe me, I believe in the sinner's prayer. I lead people in the sinner's prayer all the time. But we think that's all there is to becoming a Christian. There's more than the little prayer to being a Christian. There's more to it because once we confess and once we believe, we have to live the life of a Christian. And that is where the confusion comes in. You see, we all have our own idea of what the Christian life is. For instance, on the way to church, I was looking at my Facebook feed and I ran across a pastor who was asking the question about there's a certain celebrity, and if I told you his name, probably most of you in the room would have heard of him, especially younger, would have heard, would have heard of him. And he is leading worship in a church. And a lot of his other songs are, can I just say they're not worship songs? And he says things in some of his other songs that you would never sing about in church, you know. And so the question is, would you let him lead worship in your church? Now listen, I'm just going to tell you right up front, if the dude comes to this church, I'll let him lead worship, okay? Because I like his stuff. But, you know, and who are we to judge? I, I'm, 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 I've been questioning for probably 10 or 15 years now Exactly what does God expect for us? Here's expect from us as Christians. Here's what I know. Jesus said that they will know us by our fruit. He also said they will know us if we love one another. They will know we're Christians if we love one another. How many of you look around some of our churches and see that that's really not working out? Right? Most, most Christians could do a better job at those kind of things. So when it comes to saying who's a Christian, who's not a Christian, who does God accept, who does God not accept, let's let God do that. Okay, And that's what the Holy Spirit does. You know, He guides us. So there's more to being a Christian than just saying a prayer. There's also living your life in a way that exalts God and that pleases God. So we all have our own idea of what that is. That's why being a Christian can't be just following a set of rules because we tend to focus on some of the rules while ignoring other of the rules. Or we make such a big deal about the rules that nobody can really live up to them all. By the way, I'm just going to give you a little hint today. Nobody in this church can live up to all the rules that are in Christianity. You can't do it without Jesus, without the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, I don't know if you know this or not, but in the Old Testament, there are 6,000 rules how many of you know them all? I barely struggle with the 10 that I'm supposed to know by heart. I don't know if I could recount them all for you right now, all 10 of them right now, but there's 6,000 of them. So we make a big deal about the rules, and the fact is we put so much focus on the rules that nobody can live up to the rules anyhow. Why? Because you need the Holy Spirit to help you. You need the blood of Jesus to cover 
your sins. So people give up trying to be a Christian and they end up walking away from the faith because we try to throw all these rules and everything. This is how you're supposed to live and this is how you're supposed to be and all these rules. And we each want to have our own rule that's the most important for us. And so a new believer comes into the church and they're trying to live a Christian life and they're being told this and then they're being told this and they're being told that and they're told you have to do this and you can't do that and all these kind of things like that. When let's just let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. Had a, had a girl in one of my churches who dressed in a way that somebody else found inappropriate. She was a younger girl, came into church. Some other older woman and, and took it upon herself to go and tell her that the way she was dressed was inappropriate. And so the girl came to me. And I said, well, you know what? Here's the thing. Why don't we just let the Holy Spirit speak to you? I'm not the Holy Spirit. Gloria is my Holy Spirit sometimes because I married her and that's what her job is. I have the Holy Spirit and then I have Gloria who also functions as the Holy Spirit in my life. Tells me what I need to do, which is okay. Let's accept that. But sometimes we jump in before the Holy Spirit gets a chance to do his work. God may be working on a new believer or somebody who's just come to the faith or is struggling in an area. And and that doesn't mean we don't help them. We do help them. But we don't condemn them. I don't, if you're screwing things up, if you're here today and you're in this church and you're screwing things up in your life, You don't need me to tell you about it. You probably already know. And my job is to help you get through it. My job is to help you become more sensitive to what the Spirit may be telling you, but it certainly isn't to condemn you. Because believe me, I'm the last guy that should condemn anybody when it comes to... Because like I said before, the Holy Spirit has a special project with me keeping me out of sin, okay? I'm sure he gets tired of, okay, I got to go back down there again. You know, he has to keep doing it. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit helps the Christian become the Christian God wants us to be. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So in order to succeed and live the Christian life, you and I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you today, you cannot, it's said right there, you can only call Jesus Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is working in you, and that's how you're able to do it. You see, it's one thing to call Jesus Savior, but it's something different altogether different to make him the Lord or the master or even a better word would be the boss of your life. That takes the Holy Spirit. Number five, finally. How many of you are glad I'm not the number five now? The Holy Spirit will help give you power to share the gospel. How many of you besides me ever struggle with that one? To share the gospel. It's like Acts 1.8 but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So I'm going to admit something to you today, okay? It's just us, so nobody else, okay? So it it used to be when I was younger that I was either afraid of telling what I believed or I was embarrassed for whatever reason. I mean, I grew up in the church, And it was ingrained in me what I believed, but I was embarrassed by it or whatever. I remember when I was in high school, I would never talk about church to my school friends. I had my church friends who I loved and I spent most of my time with, and then I had my school friends. And it was like very seldom would talk to them about God, the Bible, or anything. Probably most of them didn't even know that I went to church, you know, a bazillion times every week, you know. But truthfully, the church was extremely important to me because that's where my real friends, I felt that's where my real friends were. And that was the place where I felt good about myself. But I just didn't want to talk at all about that with my friends at school. I, I, used, I joke later on in life that I was a secret agent Christian. Nobody knew, 007. And I outgrew that eventually. Plus, 
you know, when you become a pastor, people just automatically assume you're a Christian. And a problem I have today, my problem today isn't that I'm embarrassed or ashamed. It's that I miss the opportunity. I don't see. God opens an opportunity and somehow I don't see it. I, I totally miss it. God will open a door for me to talk about the gospel and I don't see it. Well, I, I believe the Holy Spirit reveals those missed opportunities. If I will pray to him, so I pray to him every day when I get up, Lord, help me see the opportunities that you're giving to me. That is part of the power the Holy Spirit gives to witness or share the gospel is that you see the opportunities. I've told you this story before, but it's a good example of how this happened to me. So uh, I, I was I was working at the airport and I was and, and this girl got on my shuttle and she was crying. She was like maybe in her early 20s or something like that. And she was crying. And she'd gotten on my shuttle. And um, she told me that um, she was crying because she had just said goodbye to her boyfriend who was going to the military. And that he was going to be gone and for boot camp and stuff like that. And so, I mean, she's just like, She's doing like the ugly cry thing. You know what I'm talking about? She's like crying, crying. Now, I just tell you something that if you want me to cry, just let me see you crying. I don't even care why you're crying. I will cry with you. I don't have to know why. I just, I just will, I would just will do that. You know, if somebody cries on TV, I'm sitting there like crying too. And I don't even know why I'm crying. It's like, it's just TV, but I'll do it. So this girl is crying and crying and crying. So I drove her over to the lot where her car was got in the lot and she goes, oh, you know what? This isn't the lot where I parked my car. She got on the wrong shuttle. And so we're heading back. I said, well, I'll take you back to the airport. Take her back to the airport. And it occurred to me, what if God put that girl on my bus for a reason? And so I said, I go, hey, you know, I don't, I don't know what you think about this, but, you know, I pastor a church in Chardon, Ohio, and you know, I'm a pastor, and you, would it be okay if I prayed If I prayed for you? And she goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm driving a bus. Now, I can't close my eyes and fold over my head and all that because I'm driving a bus. You know, you're not allowed to do that. Uh, and, and so I, I prayed for her. I prayed out loud for her because I wanted her to hear what I was praying, and I don't even remember what I prayed for. And, and, and we get to the airport, and, here's, and she said to me, so well, I told her which bus she needed to get on. I figured out which lot she was at, and I told her which shuttle she needed to get on. I said, you need to go down and get on that shuttle. And she goes, I go, I'm sorry you got on the wrong shuttle. She goes, no, I think I was supposed to get it. See, God gave me that opportunity. And luckily, luckily, at the last minute, I figured out why she was on my bus. <laughs>